Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Women's Health Podcast, A Woman's Journey, Insights That Matter. I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, and I invite you to listen to Johns Hopkins specialists discuss the latest topics in women's health. Now here's your host, Lily Shockney. Hi, this is Lily Shockney from A Woman's Journey at Johns Hopkins, and this is our podcast, Insights That Matter. In this podcast, I am joined by Dr. Stephen Frank, Professor of Anesthesiology and Critical Care Medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Frank serves as Medical Director for the Bloodless Medicine and Surgery Program. He is also Director of the Interdisciplinary Blood Management Program and of the Perioperative Blood Management Services at Johns Hopkins. Today, we are discussing the United States blood shortage and the role of bloodless medicine in combating this shortage. So welcome, Dr. Frank, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Lily. It's my privilege to be here with the group and to share the knowledge that we have about the blood shortage. According to the American Red Cross, there are several causes for this current blood shortage. 10% overall blood donations declined since March of 2020. 62% drop in college and high school blood drives due to the COVID pandemic. Student donors accounted actually for about 25% of donors in 2019, accounted for just 10% during the pandemic, however. And ongoing blood drive cancellations due to illness, weather-related closure, and staffing limitations. So we have an understanding of why people are not donating as they have in the past. What you and I are going to be discussing is, is that okay? And if it is okay, why? So Dr. Frank, your mission as the founder and director of the Johns Hopkins Blood Management Program is to promote guideline compliance to avoid giving blood transfusions unnecessarily. I was told that you have a personal story about why maintaining adequate blood supply is so important. Would you mind sharing that story with us? This goes way back to 1988 when I was an anesthesiology resident. On a weekend bicycle ride, I was hit by a car and helicoptered to shock trauma for an emergency splenectomy. So I had a ruptured spleen, a large amount of bleeding, and if it weren't for six units of blood, I wouldn't be here today because I probably lost about 10 units, which is an entire blood volume. Wow, Uh, I was going to say, that meant your gas gauge for your blood was on empty. I basically lost all my blood. They gave me six units. I left the hospital six days later, and here I am 34 years later, and I definitely had a life-saving transfusion. So the best reason to reduce unnecessary transfusions is so we have enough blood available for those who really need it, like trauma victims. That makes perfect sense because we know that there are peaks for trauma cases such as weekend holidays, Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Labor Day, where there are commonly more accidents and quite serious accidents is where helicopters are flying people to trauma centers. And you certainly can't plan ahead when you're going to have an accident in order to have blood for yourself. Tell us how safe is our blood supply and do patients have the opportunity to donate their own blood prior to a procedure if it is a procedure that the surgeon and you think that they may need blood? The blood today is safer than it's ever been. That's a simple question to answer. We now check it for all the bad viruses like HIV, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, and the tests we're using are better than ever. It's not like in the 1980s or even the 1990s when the blood was unsafe and you could actually get HIV back in the early 80s from a blood transfusion. Now the risk of that happening is supposed to be one in two million chances, okay? Which is about the same chance of getting struck and killed by lightning in the United States. Not just struck by lightning, but killed by lightning. So the blood is incredibly safe in terms of infectious disease like bacteria and virus. However, we still need to be careful and not to waste blood because all the studies have shown that less is more for transfusion. We used to give a lot more blood before HIV and hepatitis C came along. We used to transfuse liberally and get patients hemoglobin, say, above 10. But then all these randomized trials came out, actually 14 large randomized trials, 
all in the top medical journals showing that we don't have to do that anymore. If we just keep the hemoglobin above seven or eight, the patients do just as well or better. So the studies support what I call less is more in terms of transfusion. How does our body go about replacing its own blood when you're looking at hemoglobin levels that are low, obviously our body kicks in and starts manufacturing our own blood cells again, but how does that happen and how quickly does that happen? So we make our own blood cells in our bone marrow and we're constantly creating and destroying blood cells. And as long as we have enough iron in our system, B12, folate, the basic vitamins, our bone marrow has a good production of red blood cells. But when you lose blood or you give blood, those red cells have to be replenished. And it takes about two to four weeks to build your blood count back after you donate blood or lose blood. So if you give blood ahead of your surgery, you don't often have time to regenerate the red blood cells that you've donated. So if you give blood ahead of surgery and then they give it back to you during surgery, nothing's changed except the amount of red cells you've made during that time interval. And since blood only stores for six weeks on the shelf in the blood bank, the time interval is often not long enough for you to make enough new blood cells to make a difference turns out what we used to do back in the 80s when we were afraid of HIV and the blood supply, we used to have all these patients donate their own blood before surgery. We called that pre-op autologous donation. It turns out that that wasn't very effective. It made us feel good that we're getting our own blood back, but it right. didn't really make a difference in your blood count or whether you need someone else's blood because we didn't have enough time to regenerate new blood cells after the donation. What are the risks of getting someone else's blood, even though it's been totally screened for various viruses, et cetera? What are the concerns that someone may need to think about and may decide based on those concerns? You know, I think I won't do a transfusion. That yeah. really doesn't sound like that's in my best interest. There are other risks besides viral infections. There's something called transfusion-related acute lung injury we call it trally and transfusion associated circulatory overload. We call that taco. Taco and trally are the highest risk of transfusion in terms of adverse outcomes, but those are thought to occur like one in 10,000 transfusions for trally and perhaps one in a hundred transfusions for taco. But if we give the right amount of blood to the right patient for the right reason at the right time, we can avoid those kinds of complications. We know that every surgical procedure involves some degree of blood loss, even if it's minimal, but what are the ways that have proven to be able to minimize this even more so, the, so that we can have bloodless procedures done, whereas in the past, that was really not the case? We've learned a lot of lessons on this from the Jehovah's Witness population because they come in and, and they're adamant that they don't want someone else's blood from the blood bank. So we've learned lessons from them that, that we're now using for all patients to reduce transfusions. For example, if we simply give you some iron tablets before your surgery, which costs about $4, we can avoid $400 worth of transfusions. Treating preoperative anemia with iron is a good example of what we do. We can also use what's called a cell saver device during surgery. It's a machine that collects the blood you lose, and then we give you back your own blood during surgery because it washes your blood and, uh -huh. and we give it right back to the patient. I haven't met a patient yet that wouldn't rather have their own blood back during surgery compared to someone else's blood. Two other things we do quite often during surgery, there's a medication called tranexamic acid that reduces bleeding by about 30% and has virtually no side effects. It does that by a stabilizing clot that forms to reduce blood loss. And then we can just simply keep patients warm during surgery. If we keep your body temperature normal, like 98.6 or 37 degrees in centigrade, we can reduce bleeding 
because cold patients bleed more and just simply keeping you warm can reduce bleeding. So I want to caution our audience to not go to their local pharmacy and buy iron supplements and start taking them because we know that would be a problem. You know, as people say, oh, I'll go ahead and start doing that now because I'm having surgery in three months because we know that people think they're helping themselves when they're in fact not. Well, you well you're of- right. You want to have your hemoglobin measured before the surgery. And then if you're iron deficient, then you would benefit. It turns out that most anemia in this country, even around the world, is from iron deficiency. But you're right, not all is. So we can't just start taking iron willy-nilly, if you will. Right, yes. I know when I've had blood drawn for various tests and, you know, she's on tube number five, and I'll say, golly, I think before we're done, I'm going to have a whole unit of blood that I will have donated to get these tests done. Are you sure you really need to draw all of this blood and of course, the tech will say, I'm following the orders here and there are certain color tubes I need to use and that's that. But I do think that sometimes we have a tendency to over test, shall we say, and that means drawing blood. And sometimes it's quite a bit. Very good point. You're absolutely correct. And where this really matters the most Lily is in the intensive care unit because they're they're not just drawing five tubes of blood. They're doing that twice a day for maybe a week in a row because ICU patients, some of them stay there a long time. We measure the amount of blood that patients lose in the ICU just for lab testing. And it turns out to be about 1% of your blood volume that they're taking every day. If you have five liters of blood in your body and they take 50 milliliters, that's 1%. It really adds up in the ICU. And we started using smaller phlebotomy tubes, especially in the ICU, in the operating rooms, especially in Jehovah's Witness patients. We use these very small phlebotomy tubes to reduce the amount of blood that we send to the lab. That's very smart. Very smart. I know some people are curious to know whether or not acupuncture or the use of certain herbs would reduce bleeding during surgery. I don't have any information on acupuncture But the only information I have on herbs are that certain nutritional supplements can actually increase bleeding during surgery. There's not a whole lot of good data on this, but there's a list of five or 10 supplements that can increase bleeding. Fish oil is supposedly one of them that a lot of people take. Garlic supplements, flaxseed oil. I think these effects are minimal, but if you're having delicate surgery where bleeding is important, that they're going to tell you to stop taking those nutritional supplements at least a week before surgery. Assuming that the patient has informed their provider that they're taking these things, right? Because sometimes people will say, well, this was over the counter. You know, I didn't need a prescription for it. So right. I don't have to tell anybody I'm doing this. This couldn't have any impact on blood loss or on my operation or on anything else. Sure. And this is really helpful information to caution people that all because you can get it over the counter doesn't mean it's a good idea to do it. I always say to patients, when in doubt, leave it out. When we don't know what it does or we do know and definitely should not be taking it around surgery time. And hopefully it will also bring up a discussion point of why are you taking it and should you be taking it at all? Tell me, how does the Johns Hopkins Blood Management Program keep track of available blood supply through the health system? How do you know where it is, what's available and and such? First of all, we have monthly meetings with the health system. So all the entities, we meet once a month to talk about supply and demand for blood because there's two sides of the equation. Supply is how much blood we can purchase from our suppliers like the Red Cross. And demand is how many units of red blood cells, plasma, platelets, and cryo we are giving. You know, there's four different types of major blood components, not just red blood cells. And we have these dashboards built on a business intelligence software platform called Tableau. And we can watch day by day how much blood is being used across the health system. And it even shows us how much blood is giving inside and outside of guidelines. So we send these reports every month from our dashboards that have a green, yellow, red format. And red means outside of guideline. Green is inside guideline. Yellow is intermediate. By sending these reports out to all the providers who give blood, we're encouraging better guideline compliance. 
That's wonderful. I really like that. I'm known for saying you cannot manage what you do not measure. I love the concept of the dashboard and the very simple color-coded system. And giving feedback to people usually does result in changes in behavior. So people that might be in the yellow will now start becoming green, which is great. If someone so, is staying in the red and they're repeatedly in the red, do you have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with that red person? <laughs> so the, uh, great question. So these reports go out every month and each department gets their own report with their providers. So say orthopedic surgery, right? There may be 11 orthopedic surgeons all on the same graph and you can compare yourself to your peers if you're the one orthopedic surgeon giving the most blood in the red zone out of guidelines, you don't need to tell them that. It's on a picture, on a graph. Since surgeons and doctors in general are competitive creatures, we don't want to be in last place, right? <laughs> so there's incentive to do better by comparing ourselves to our peers. Very smart. Very smart. Let's now talk a little bit more about the bloodless medicine and surgery program. What exactly is bloodless medicine? Bloodless medicine is really a team sport. It involves taking care of patients who ask to avoid transfusions. And it's really a team of people that we have that enable care of the patient without a transfusion. For example, we have hematologists, we have surgeons, we have anesthesiologists, we have intensive care physicians. It's a team sport. And what we do is we prepare the patient for surgery and plan their course so we can conserve their own blood volume so they don't need a transfusion with someone else's blood. And it really began with the Jehovah's Witness population back in the 1940s. They were a pretty new religious group, but they decided back then that the Bible prohibited transfusions from blood from other people. At first we thought, oh, that's kind of crazy, you know, that they don't want transfusions. But then along came HIV and the worst year to have a blood transfusion was 1984 for HIV. And then along came hepatitis C and the worst year to have that from a transfusion was like 1990. So then we thought maybe the Jehovah's Witnesses aren't so crazy because no one wanted blood back in the 80s. It was almost dangerous to get a transfusion. Uh -huh. So now that the blood is much safer, we're still learning lessons from Jehovah's Witnesses to do what I call extreme blood management. Like when the blood shortage came along with the pandemic, now we have to do more with less. So we're taking lessons learned from Jehovah's Witnesses, like using the cell saver to give them back their own blood, giving iron supplements before surgery, using trans Tranexamic acid to reduce bleeding, keeping patients warm, using smaller phlebotomy tubes. We're doing all these things for the Jehovah's Witnesses, only we do them to the extreme. So we're not trying to just reduce unnecessary transfusions. We're avoiding them completely. And guess what? When we treat them with this special type of care, they do just as well as patients who accept transfusions. Interesting. How is it determined intraoperatively how much blood a patient has lost? as carefully as we can, because I'm an anesthesiologist, so people think we just put patients to sleep and wake them back up. <laughs> Actually, we do everything for the patient uh, except the surgery. So when they're losing You're blood- You're at the helm. You're the captain at the helm. Yeah, the surgeons operate, we do everything else. So we have to measure the bleeding amount very carefully. We have graduated containers that are marked. And uh -huh. then we sometimes even weigh the sponges to see how much uh -huh. blood is on the sponges. Uh -huh. We carefully measure. And you have a, about a gallon of blood in your body, actually about a gallon and a fourth. But I round it off to a gallon because people can think of a milk jug, right? Yes, As yes. A gallon. So if you lose 20% of that, which is one liter of blood, that's when we start to worry about needing replacement. If you lose 40% of your blood, you're going to be in shock. We have to replace the lost blood with either IV fluids or blood itself. It takes training is just as much as an art as a science sometimes to estimate how much blood loss has occurred and how and when to replace it. Let's talk a little bit about the patient's blood pressure during the operation. My understanding is that if we keep the blood pressure 
a little bit on the lower side, that also may help with prevention of additional blood loss. Even if the patient has hypertension, for example, we want to bring that pressure level down. And I know that you're in charge of doing that, right? You are in charge of their vital signs per se, which is why I see you as the, you're at the helm, you're the captain at the helm. So how does that work? How do you monitor someone's blood pressure level and do your best to control it so that it too can be a benefit to the patient, hoping that they won't need to have a transfusion as a result? So what you said is absolutely correct. If we can do a controlled hypotension to bring the blood pressure down to say 20% below normal, then we can reduce bleeding that way, especially for orthopedic and spine surgeries because bone bleeding occurs and that is very dependent on the blood pressure. Your bone is very vascular. So if we can bring your blood pressure from 120 over 80, say down to 90 over 60, you can really decrease bleeding. You want to be careful though, that you don't drop it too low because then you're going to have problems with your vital organs like your brain, heart, liver, kidneys. And if you drop the pressure too low, those vital organs aren't going to get enough oxygen. We call it controlled hypotension. And how about the duration of the operation itself? How much of an influence does that have on this situation? There's different kinds of bleeding during surgery. There's fast, rapid bleeding, and then Uh there's slow, steady bleeding. So for example, if you're having a spinal fusion, quite a common surgery, I've even had one. It's a slow, steady bleeding over maybe three hours. But if you're having vascular surgery, like an aortic aneurysm repair, you can lose the same amount of blood in like 10 minutes. The challenges are different, but nonetheless, We still have to measure the amount of bleeding and know if and when to give a transfusion. Did you think when you had that serious traumatic accident that this would be your career path today? No, uh, (laughs) mainly because that was 34 years ago, but it does resonate. I like to say blood saves lives when you need it, but only increases risk and cost when you don't. That's the last slide in my lecture. Very good point. Who are candidates for giving blood? Well, they've recently loosened the criteria because of the shortage. The Red Cross, for example, has a whole list. You have to pass a questionnaire first. There's like 20 or more questions to try to reduce viral risk. For example, (laughs) certain behaviors like IV drug abuse, that's on the questionnaire because you don't want a high-risk population for viral hepatitis, for example. But even then, they screen the blood regardless. It's a double screening test. If you're over, I think it's 120 pounds body weight and your hemoglobin is over 12 and a half, so you're not anemic, and you pass the questionnaire test, you haven't lived in Europe more than three months during a certain period of time. Was uh, that during the old mad cow disease? The mad cow era, uh-huh. yeah. So if you pass all the questions and your body's not terribly small or your hemoglobin's not low, then you can donate. You can go online to the Red Cross site and look at the exclusion criteria. That'll save you a trip to the donor center if if they don't want your blood. I believe that you can donate up to the age of like, I think it's 78 or 79 if you're healthy, but they do have a cap on it so that you can't keep donating even if you are a healthy older person. Also, the question of your history of cancer is also something that the Red Cross inquires about. And if you've had a life-threatening cancer in the last five years, then they'll steer you away and say, come back after you hit the five-year mark. And I know that for myself and also for my husband, because he and I both have had multiple cancers. When someone does donate blood and then they find hepatitis or, you know, heaven forbid, HIV. I just want our audience to know that the individual that did donate is informed that they do have this. And of course, they're encouraged to see a provider regarding it. So it isn't kept a secret, you know, saying we're just going to throw this blood away and not tell the person that gave it, which would not be very helpful. I also know that there are individuals that will donate specifically in the hope of helping cancer patients that have various types of blood 
cancers too, so that uh, donations are not solely for surgery or trauma and such, but also as treatment outside of the operating sure. room. Much of our blood, including most of our platelets, which is one component of blood, go to the oncology center for cancer patients. And yes. the, the patients with leukemias and lymphomas are the ones that need the most transfusions. And that's ongoing. It's not just for a month or so. That's for a long, long time in most cases. Well, I really do appreciate you enlightening us. I think that if our listening audience ends up on Jeopardy and they've got a column called Blood, they could win uh, because (laughs) you've provided such wonderful answers that are easy to understand and really do inform us about who needs blood, who does not, and why. And won't it be wonderful? Because I do believe that we'll reach a point where we can stop worrying and fretting about making sure that we've got enough blood in the blood banks for surgical procedures. And you certainly are a pioneer in helping to make that happen. So thank you so much. It's my privilege to be with the podcast today, and I hope it was enlightening. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you for joining us to hear from anesthesiologist Dr. Steve Frank. Uh, We hope you will join us next month for another educational and information podcast featuring another Johns Hopkins medicine expert. In the meantime, I invite you to visit a woman's journey website at hopkinsmedicine.org forward slash a woman's journey for details on upcoming webcasts and our in-person and virtual programs. Again, thank you so much. All the best. Thank you for listening to a woman's journey podcast. Join me, Kelly Gear Ripkin, your host, Lily Shockney, and a variety of Johns Hopkins experts on the first Thursday of each month to learn about medical advances in women's health. A Woman's Journey is grateful for the unrestricted educational grants from HRH Foundation that supports our podcast series, Insights That Matter. For more information about A Woman's Journey's virtual programs occurring throughout the year and our monthly webcasts and podcasts, visit our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey. Like us on Facebook and Twitter and visit our website at hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey. Until next time, stay well.